a lot of these CRMs and DMSs are putting in place terms that say, hey, if you're a certified provider, you can only use this access we give you. Yes. And so then you're locked out, you have partial data. And then you're trying to serve the dealer and the dealer's getting frustrated that this is like bad data. And the core problem is that they don't have access to all the data. Yeah. Welcome to the Strategy with Jason podcast. Tune in for everything you need to know to stay in the know regarding the automotive industry. Here's your host, Jason Harris. Hey, 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 what's going on, Podcast Nation? It is Jason Harris here, and thank you for joining me on another episode of The Drive, Las Vegas edition. We're here in beautiful Las Vegas, the Digital Dealer Conference. I have an amazing guest with me. I have David with four eyes. David, what's going on, man? How's, How's it going? This is great. This it's gonna is be fun. awesome. Yeah. It's going to be fun. We're going to talk everything and everything, anything and everything we want to talk about when it comes to data. And you can't turn off the podcast. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> all right, David, I love kicking off these podcasts with a little origin story. A, because I'm always fascinated because I don't think anybody just wakes up one day and goes, huh, I want to be in the automotive industry and this is going to be amazing. So I find it's typically you're either you're born into the business, you stumble into the business, or maybe like me, you get conned into the business. So, so let's start there. What is the origin story of how you got started in the automotive industry? Well, so a uh, little different. Um, before, I've always been an entrepreneur, but before Four Eyes, uh, I'd started at Purence, mm -hmm. a digital marketing company. And before I had Purence, I actually had a sustainable lumber company, uh, reclaimed wood uh, oh, and cool. taking down old barns in the Midwest and shipping them to really wealthy people in, you know, mainly Southern California. <laughs> yes. And I had done, uh, I was doing a lot of PPC, this is like 2003, mm -hmm. right? De doing a lot of PPC at a time when people weren't doing it and just was crushing it. And I had a, this whole system of marketing and then I had this uh, little, this other system that I was really rustic. I've always been a hack programmer. And it was a really rustic system that when someone was on my website, it would just like ping, it would just send an email. It was like five lines of code. It would send an email, and I had Outlook at the time. It would say like, "Oh, someone's looking for Reclaim Redwood, and they're on your website, right?" Because you used to be able to just pass all the the search term yeah. right into the URL, and so I could just um, email it to myself. Well, that's and, pretty. That's a good hack. Well, whenever my phone would ring, I would just look at the last thing in the email box. So ah. like my phone would ring like 404 area code. I'd be like, "Okay, someone from Atlanta is on my website right now looking for Reclaim Redwood." So I'd be like, oh, how you doing? And they'd be like, oh, tell me about your company. Oh, a little of this, a little of that, a lot of Reclaim Redwood. What are you looking for? And so it was kind of like a parlor trick. And, but then I made, I built out the system so I could, I could call them and follow up with them um, after, you know, as they were hitting my website. Yeah. And I just started crushing it in sales. I was, ended up like becoming the biggest, I think the biggest broker of uh, hand-hewn beams in the world. No way. And was doing it with this like, tactic, this kind of sales tactic by, by leveraging my website data. And so that got me, that's really what the impetus was started that, that was for us. Yeah. yeah okay. But, uh, but we had ad parents when we started ad parents, we just did, we did, um, work for everybody. We just did everything. And we worked with this notorious, I think I can, I can call them this, um, out of Portland. Uh, they're funny and we love them, but they're, a, they're a notoriously, they were a notoriously picky dealership. Okay. Who had kind of fired a lot of vendors and we started working with them and they were uh, a CDJR dealer. We started working with them and Stellantis or FCA or whatever they were being called at the time mm -hmm. uh, was like, wait, you actually like a vendor? Like, who is this vendor? And so, you know, from there we got introduced in the programs and all that stuff. So um, that's kind of the long version of the story. But so you, you definitely stumbled into it. Stumbled. And, you know, you got bit by the bug. So yeah, you're in. So yeah. You're in. <laughs> I love auto. I mean, I think uh, it, it's funny being in Portland, Oregon, yep. where you know we don't have the auto talent, right? We don't have people with a lot of automotive experience. Yep. And but I think auto's really interesting because I think it's like there's an opportunity right now. You know, everyone can kind of feel that it, there's so much potential for disruption. Yes. But I think like the two industries that are actually the most important to save to to like look at carefully are auto dealers and truck drivers. Yeah. Right. They're everywhere. They serve, they give a lot of people paying jobs that, you know, are high paying jobs where they're feeding their families and they don't necessarily have a ton of career mobility. Yeah. Right. So if, if auto dealerships were to go away, which I don't think anyone thinks they will, if auto dealerships were to go away, that would be like a huge, huge structural impact. problem. hundred yeah. percent. 
Well, man, let's 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 get into data chat because yeah. data or data. I'd say tomato, land where, tomato, tomato, tomato. tomato. Yeah, land where you are. <laughs> um, no, look, you know, as an as an industry, we've been told by vendors for many many years that you know, well, you dealers are sitting on a gold mine of data. It is just diamonds and rubies and emeralds yeah, down there, yeah. and all you need to go do is mine it. You yeah, know. Yeah. <sighs> But you know, we never really deep dive into it. Of really, what what is the data that is available? Who owns that data? How that data can actually be actionable? You know, it's like it, it just I, let, let's let's go down that rabbit hole. Yeah, I mean, well, I think one, I, I think there's a misconception with data that more is better, right? Mm, that, that yeah. like I think that's a like um, quality is better than more. Yes, for a, a, a thousand times out of a thousand times, and so like. Um, one, I think it's like the foundation, you start with the foundational data. Like if you look at the foundational data, of like the CRM, inventory, website, DMS, right? Mm -hmm. Those are like the foundational data that, uh, that comes off a, a dealership, that a dealership like processes. I think that like part of the interesting thing is that we're not asking the question of what does own your data really mean? Yes. And the auto deal, the auto and how that impacts you, how that impacts right? you, right? Yes. Cause like, like if you just like, I just define it simply like ownership is access. Yes. If you do not have access to the data, you do not own it. Hmm. That's um, a very simple, but yeah, you're hundred percent right. Yes. But, but I think it's a problem because I think like people aren't aware of the contracts that they're having vendors sign Oof, no. that the, that prohibit actual ownership mm -hmm. uh, for the dealer. And I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Like, so you look at the CR, the APIs for CRMs. Yep. Right. Um, there's not a, really an API out there that's robust enough to get 100% of what is in the CRM. No, you're getting bits and pieces of it. Some CRMs are better than others, but yeah, you're right. Par you're never, you're never gonna partial data yes. and, and even the best one, you know, you look at like Fortellus with Elite, like they don't have notes yes. uh, coming off. You can't get notes out of the, the Fortellus. So and, that, and Fortellus is actually one of the better ones out there to work with. Yeah, absolutely. And so like, but that's missing. So without yes. the notes, you don't have context. Like you might say, oh, here's a great lead or what are you doing with this lead? But you don't see in the note that the guy's like, this is a 500 credit score. He told me never to call him again or whatever the note is. Mm -hmm. The note is the context. You can't get that. Structurally though, a lot of these CRMs and DMSs are putting in place terms that say, hey, if you're a certified provider, you can only use this access we give you. Yes. And so then you're locked out. You have partial data. And then you're trying to serve the dealer and the dealer's getting frustrated that this is like bad data. And the core problem is that they don't have access to all the data. Yes. And, and, and look, we're, we can we can only take action on the data that we have. You can, Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think like for that, like, you know, one of the things we advise is we have like a data addendum that we advise dealers to to push out to their vendor, to their, mm -hmm. their you know, I would say call them their like their filing cabinet partners, website, inventory, DMS. Yes that basically says, hey, if you don't have access via your API, you can't prohibit access through like, you know, like the term 100%. hostile integration, where like we we quote unquote hostile integrate, right? So well, it's you, a, you, you, yes, I understand what you do. You've had to do. You've had, you have to. You have to because you just can't, right? And, and one of the ones in that list that I would also add into that bucket of yours is also marketplaces. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, you know, we pay a super amount of money to post our inventory on there in a, in a seen amount of data that is being generated and collected off that. And to your point, we don't have access to it. Yeah, and, and one point I just want to make is before I call myself a hostile integrator is that term. <laughs> I like is, it, it was that a, sounds like a t-shirt. It does, it is, it will be a great t-shirt. I know, I know. I, I kind of wish we did it for, for a digital dealer here, but, uh, but that term is a made up term. Mm -hmm. That term, I think, was like CDK or Reynolds and Reynolds came up with that term to try to, you know, paint the picture bad so they could charge DMS fees. Well, of course, right? But it's, there's no it's such like, thing it's as it's like real estate integration. agents convincing that we still need real estate agents. Yeah, so it, it uh, <laughs> there's no such thing. It's a made-up term, but it sounds so bad, you know, yes. that oh, they're hostily integrating. Well, that's because that's all you can do in the current environment if you want to get 100% of the data. Yeah, you're gonna have to build out those RPAs to even extract that kind of information. Yeah, and so I think it's like, it, it's not fair to say to your CRM or DMS, like you have to have an API for everything. Like that's like they have. Yes. But I think what they can't do is reasonably withhold access if they don't provide it an API. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And the funny thing is, is 
You just have to be educated, all right, around what we're talking about for them to even push the envelope. Because, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Well, and, and the other one I would say that goes on top of that is like uh, transparency around fees. Mm. So yes. the other piece with these contracts is they they prohibit any transparency about what you're actually being charged. Yep. So if you look at it, you know, you might have a monthly fee, maybe the monthly fee is quote unquote reasonable, but then there's a setup fee and an installation mm-hmm. fee and an a certification fee and all these other fees. Some are better than others and, and some so, are a little and, ridiculous. And so those add up, right? And like, what's interesting too is like, depending- well, they're, they're profiting, they're profiting they're, off of that. Yeah. The dealership's not seeing any, any piece of that. Don't you think that's kind of weird? Well, it's weird to charge, to, to not tell the dealer what you're charging their partners to access their data. I 100% agree. Because I think if the dealers knew, they would be like, no, I'm sorry, excuse me? Yeah, oh. and, and, and the piece that's actually kind of funny about it, or not funny, but un, almost potentially unfair, is their fees might actually be reasonable, but depending on how the the vendor is processing those fees because they're not allowed to be transparent, right? Yeah. If they put them into their cost of goods sold, right? Like we've raised money, we have like investors, like. If you put it in your cost of goods sold, you're expected to get a certain margin on it. Yes. So you put 70% on that. So you take 200 bucks and you put 70% on that and of that cost. And all of a sudden your product is significantly more expensive. Well, and, and we've had that question asked to us many times, right? You know, and it's, but it is, it's just the cost right now. Um, now, right now we're like, like where we are, where Matador is, we're not, we're not, it's just, it's cost of doing business. It is what it is. We're still going to maintain, maintain yeah. it because we it, we're just, and I'm sure you guys are the same too. You, you get, you get, you're doing it for the benefit of the dealership. Well, you have right? to. You, you have to. The, the the times are changing, and there will be a change. A hundred percent. I I am so positive. Over next, you know, 24, uh, 24 to forty eight months, that we're going to see a, a considerable shift in dealers demanding. Uh, higher level access and much more reasonable cost of access. Yeah, and, and and just one demand transparency. Like, hey, if you're charging people to get my data, I need to know what you're charging them. Yeah, right. Yeah. And and like and some do, but most don't. To your point. Yeah, yes. yeah. And and some are changing. And like, you know, we uh, I'll give a shout out to like Vin Solutions. Like yep. they've been incredibly, uh, they understand the problems, and they're so they're being like their attitude towards understanding that dealers need access to their data has been great. Mm-hmm. Right. Elite Elite actually has been great for us. Um, yeah, the big three, Vin, Dealer Socket, E-Lead, all been great. And I find some of the smaller players have been also very much so open or you know, collaborative, right? That's the thing. In, and I don't, think, I don't think dealerships are necessarily aware of just how challenging uh, for, some, for, for vendors to try to collaborate with each other. And they're just curtain vendors that are just not not playing nice. Well, and they're killing the little <laughs> innovators. You know, yes, like, that's a good like point. the small companies that are like yes. scrappy and trying to do stuff are just get hit and getting hit with a wall. Because they can't how even can get, you do it. They can't even get a call back. They like like we're big enough and have enough clout that we can like like work work with them. Oh. But if you have less than a hundred dealers or you have you're just starting out with something, like like good luck. And you know, let's talk about a little bit about the data that we're talking about. Because I, I know we've talked yeah. <laughs> already talked a lot about data, but I think maybe for some of the people that are watching and listening, you know, they don't necessarily understand, you know, what data sets are we looking for, yeah. all right, and how we can make them actionable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so first, like when I look at first thing is like, what are they putting in their system? Yes. So anything they're putting in a system, they need to say, do they have the ability to get it out? And that, re- as far as what the dealers are able to put into it, yeah, you know? like, yes. like there's like a base layer of inefficiency in how much time, like things that should be simple, take a dealership, <laughs> right? Like watch a dealer run a close rate report, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. And then uh, extrapolate that if you're a dealer group and you now have to clean up all these sources, you know, you'll, you'll have like cars.com or Edmonds or auto trader, your website, they'll be listed in your CRM 14,000 different ways. A hundred percent. And so you, then you got to bring it all in Excel and clean it all up and do all this stuff. Well, that could, that's easy for us to do with our access, with access to the data, the, yep. that cleanup, uh, forecasting, pipeline reports, all of these things that, especially when you start to look at where the website <laughs> data is now informing mm-hmm. that, where you go like, wait, I'm trying to understand close rates. Well, what are the close rates of the people who are still shopping my website? What are the people of the close rate of the leads that are still have a level of, you know, are showing signs of life? 
Um, and, and this this opens up the, the attribution can of worms, you know, because I think for, for such a long time, the only form of attribution that we've been able, or conversion, yeah. all right, that we can kind of account for are appointments, deals closed, Yeah. right? But there are so many more impactful stages that the customer goes through yeah. that the data is there, but it hasn't always been available. Yeah. You know, unless you're working with the right partner. Yeah, and, and attribution's really interesting because it's like there's a million different ways to do it. I think, you know, one of the challenges with attribution is that it's oftentimes interesting the first time you see it, you know, and it's, it's sort of not interesting until there's a problem. <laughs> right? That's a good way to look right? at it. Like, yes. <laughs> like until you're like, oh, shoot, what's going on? <laughs> what's going yeah, on? so like, um, but I'm, you know, and I'm a big, huge fan of like, asking the question like when i talk about like using data of like how does this data how can you use the data to increase close rates yes so like i'm a huge believer in like you know the process of just dialing for dollars is is turns over people 100 percent, and is a burnout job and leads to bad result leads to you know because if you have a three percent close rate Mm-hmm. You're, you know, people always say, oh, sales people are lazy. That's why they don't do a quality response. It's because they have a 3% close rate because 97% of the time they're failing. So why spend 35 minutes writing an email? Exactly. If it's going to, if you're going to have a, if you have a 3% close rate and you want a quality response, you better make it super snappy to do a quality response. Well, it, it's a training and a preparation and uh, a, a data problem. It's kind of like a combination of, of, of yeah. things that come into it that, that creates this this issue, um, there's probably a sprinkle of laziness in there. I'm not gonna lie, there is probably a sprinkle of laziness. Well, there's, there's, but the, but it's laziness based <laughs> off of their data, right? Which is like, hey, these people aren't responding enough. So I just gotta give up. I give up. They're yeah. not responding. They're yeah. not engaging with me. I'm just going to just give up. Yeah. Which there's a part of me that empathizes with that, and then there's the dealer side of me that goes, no, I paid you to do a job, like. You're going to do the job. Well, yeah, but it's like, it's also like prioritizing, right? If like, well, that's true too. If, if I give like, which would you rather have? Would you rather have a hundred leads that close at 5% or 10 leads that close at 50%? You know what? Um, for me, when I was, when I was a dealer, I had this aha moment. Okay. And it was just constant frustration around conversation around how many leads, how many leads, how many leads, how many leads. And I just said, I'm done. I'm done counting leads. I don't give a crap how many leads I had. How many conversations did we have? Yeah. Let's start there, yeah. right? Because yeah. if I can optimize anything, right, yeah. my my processes at the dealership level, it's going to be optimizing our communication strategy and how we're handling or or, or up, handling those conversations. I like right? that. Yeah. So that was and that was years ago. What about 2013? Um, 2013, and I just I stopped counting leads and I started counting conversations. And now that was that was a real cool time for me because it created a mindset that I wasn't anticipating. Yeah, that, right. I like that a lot. I, I, I gotta, feel that. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, but how did dealers kind of get? I don't. I think actually, I'll take it back. I actually think we are getting better around having the conversation about how many leads we have. Yeah. Um, maybe that's because as an industry, we just haven't been counting because every car that comes in through the dealership right now has just been selling on its own. Um, but I still think some of the most progressive dealerships out there are doing a good job at analyzing their communication strategy. And I feel like we're in this era right now or this space of like, the theme is just like optimization. Yeah. Like I gotta optimize I got my process my communication strategy, my marketing strategy, you know, and it's just, it, I think some of those progressive dealers out there are doing that right now. But I think there's a fair amount that just don't know. But but to like your point on on like optimizing, winning is contagious, right? If, if, you, if, you, <laughs> this, if, you, yes. if you pick up the phone and you have a great conversation, you're like amped. You're like, Get, bring me on the mm-hmm. next one, bring mm-hmm. me on the next one. So that's why I think that, I, I think the myth in that like 10 leads or 100 leads is 10 leads, give them the wins. Right, yes. like one of the, and I'll give you this on like software, like, and I've had dealers mention this to me. Like, one of the things we learned with Four Eyes is like, how can you deliver good news in the day? Like, if so much software is built to alert you that you're doing something wrong, yes, right, like, bang, bang, wrong, fail, notification, wrong, notification, fail. Notif- alert, alert, like, yeah. that's depressing <laughs> as hell. Like, tell me when I'm doing something right, like, give me good news, right? Yes. Give, give me sales opportunities, give me someone that I thought was dead that's like like still in market, like give me something like, and build people up to have to win more. 100%. 
Well, I, I think let's 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 go down the rabbit hole of optimization because, like I said, I think right now um, there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity where you know things are shifting depending on your OEM, maybe faster rather than later, uh, just depending on what those inventory levels are. You know, but if 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 you're out there and you're watching and you're listening to this right now, you know, really dive into what are my strat, what are my optimization strategies? All right, I have time to figure this out. All right, let's figure that out. Well, I, I mean, everyone, I, I think this is a pretty common answer, but okay, so if you could work on marketing or sales process, you could only work on one, Ooh, right? That's a good one. I Which, like where, where where would you optimize? Oh, sales process. Sales process. 100%. Well, I'll call it buying process now. You know, <laughs> you, you know what's funny though, is like walk around the floor of Digital Dealer and it's 95% of the companies are there with marketing yes. solutions. Yes, doesn't that just kind of piss you off a little bit? Like, well, I'm gonna be honest I, with you. Like, you, you know, I, I'm gonna get some slack for saying this out loud, but I get frustrated. You know, I'm like, because that's not, I. But I'm just a firm believer that's not what the industry needs right yeah, now. Yeah, but you know why it is? Hmm. Because in marketing, they can take their their money without asking anything of them, of the dealership. <laughs> right. That's true. So it's it's hey, I can do this for you, and you don't have to do anything. Yes. Right. So like when I look at optimizing. I think, okay, how can you build sales process solutions that require less from your people? Getting more with less. Yeah, like, like. All, I mean, who's not a fan of that? Well, and but like, like getting it, you know, cause like, it's interesting in Four Eyes, we have these different modules and two of the modules can be turned on and don't require, and they help close rate and they help process and they don't require a thing from the dealership. Mm -hmm. Those work amazing. Right? They, they don't churn, we, we have, it's, it's great. Two of our products require that the dealership sort of you know meets us halfway. Yes. And that's a much harder sell. Like, but it shouldn't be, right? Because I mean, I, I think, look, maybe I'm just having a little tough love because of the dealer principle in me. I'm just like, no, that is what I should be looking for. That is what I should be chewing on. I should be you know, spending more time on my process and, and investing more into what I call the process you know, operation tech, you know, that's, that's where it should be. It, it, but we do, we all get ended up getting bucketed into this marketing bubble because I think that's where the most disposable income is. But yeah, no, I mean, I, there, I've seen some great examples. I'm sure you have too, but of dealers actually in, implementing um, good process optimizing technology. Yeah. And well, to, to, to counter your point though, to be a little uh, contrarian to your point, let's do it. If a dealer, said, if you said, hey, you should be spending your time working with all the software you have. If a dealer spent their time working with every vendor that asked for more of their time, they would have zero time. Okay, so yes, time, intentionality is key, right? Yeah. So one of the things I did very early on, I find today, you know, still some of the most progressive dealerships still do it. I mean, there's definitely been a benefit of, you know, doing 500 interviews over the last few years is, you know, I've got to, you know, really deep dive into some, you know, very, very successful operations. And, and the way that they treat their marketing efforts or their time is the key to really saving yourself time is being completely transparent with your vendors. Like really being open with them. Like yeah. here's what success looks like for me. These are the goals, these are the KPIs, these are maybe some of the challenges and create that vendor partner relationship, not just that vendor relationship. Yeah, that's funny. My friend Peter Hogavine, at, uh, he's at Lithia now and he was telling me, He's like, you got to train your team not to ask how was your month. He's like, because there you go. Dealers are trained to just tell them horrible, horrible. We had a horrible. You know, they just yeah. want to beat you up all the time, and so it's yeah. not, it's not, it's starting out in a non-honest place, and it, you don't get the best results by that no. way. Hundred percent. Yeah, 100%. That, that's funny. Um, <laughs> but I think for any vendor out there that may be listening to the podcast, they're fair. They're fair about that too you know, is getting to that place of creating that vendor partnership. Um, what would be some of the advice you'd give, you know, to people that want to get to that type of relationship with their clients? I mean, well, on that on that front, I think a level of honest and integrity at the, on the vendor level, you know, all us vendors are sort of, we live in like constant fear of yes. the bad report or the bad call from the dealer. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think like, try to try to do a culture of like no white lies you know like because i think those start to add up well yeah, yeah if, if we're asking for transparency we need to be giving you transparency. need to be like if you mess something up just say you messed it up 
Yes. Right. And like, actually people are much more forgiving of that. We learn more. Everybody does, you know, but I, I think as dealers though, you need to create a safe place for failure to happen. You know, yeah. Not oh, just yeah. not, not, you know, for your team, but yeah. you know, also for your vendors, because you know, we, we learn the most. I hate to say, but we do. We learn more from our failures than we do our successes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think for vendors, I mean, uh, and you know, we've we've learned so much. Is you know, your people have to be they have to be expert at something. Yes. Right. So like, if they're not if they're not expert in automotive, they better be expert with your product. <laughs> right. They got to be expert at, at one or both is amazing, but one or the other, for sure. Right. So I think like what's frustrating to dealers is when you staff with people who are experts in neither. Jack of all trades. Master and, of none. and so they're like, why am I talking to this person? Like, why are you? Everyone's wasting everyone's time, you know, and like and then like the the ability to get to, to fast answers. I mean, just like because dealers always will challenge you with like something you haven't thought of or you haven't done. Which I love. Which is amazing. Right? <laughs> so like, actually, it's one of like, my one of my favorite things about being a vendor is is the challenge. Like I, I, you know what's funny? I I will take skinnier deals if I feel like the client's going to challenge me more. Oh yeah, for sure, hundred percent. I mean, that's one way. Like we'll negotiate more with the people that we're like they will make us a better yes a better client. Yeah, for sure, one thousand one thousand percent. I um, I'm also a huge fa- uh, fan of the framework. Every there's every great movie is two great scenes and no bad scenes. And every great experience is two great scenes, no bad scenes. Um, That's true. But the reason I like that so much is because it may, you know, there's, we live in this like surprise and delight, like uh, framework where it's just like, just make people happy, do amazing things all the time. That's, that's not scalable or sustainable. No. But the, the two great scenes, no bad scenes means you just look for bad scenes you don't need to make them great. You just make them not bad, right? Like I, I like that. I like, never thought of that. Yeah, way. and then you just make, and then you pick your. Okay, here are the moments we're gonna make amazing. You know, I I always think if I owned a dealership, like I would make the best coffee. Oh, plant. ever over the top. Over the top. Hundred percent. Crazy. So it's funny you say that because so something I did at my dealership, my staff hate, is the coffee machines always sit outside, like in in the showroom, right? Yeah. I took the coffee machine. I put it in the back. So oh, they, so they had to make them coffee. They had to make the customer coffee. Oh yeah. They couldn't stand. They honestly hated me for it one hundred percent. But it was to take that moment to connect and to bring someone something, ask them how they take it, make it for them. I know. We we did this thing. This is before COVID. Now we're we're like way more remote now. But if someone came in the office, yep. I didn't care who they were. I didn't care if they were the UPS, I didn't care if they were homeless, I didn't care if they were a customer, who they were. You had to offer them coffee and water. And if they said no, if unless you saw them say no, even if you heard them say no, if you only heard them, you still had to offer them. So what happened is people would come in our office and they'd be offered coffee and water like eight times. It became a game to like try to break them. And but <laughs> they but what happened was they left the <laughs> office being like, these are the nicest people I've ever met. They acknowledged <laughs> me. And then it also gave a cultural message to my staff that yes. we care about people, service. intentional. Yes. And so our job acceptance rate went through the roof. Yeah. Because people are coming in to interview and they're like, I want to work here. Everybody acknowledged me. Yes. Everyone walked by. Everyone offered me water, coffee. Like it was like uh, transformational. It's like a, a mindset. It's not a mindset. Look, I, I, look, I know we're going to tell you yeah. in our conversation. I'm confident we probably could jam for a whole hour yeah. Right? Yeah, easily, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, but for David, for everybody out there that's watching and listening right now who would maybe like to connect with you, learn more about you, or even follow yeah. along with your journey, what's the best way to do so? Well, foureyes.io, um, my information's all over the place. David Steinberg, uh, I give out my cell phone number too. Yeah, Anybody can ahead. call me, 503-730-9179. But, uh, but foureyes.io, David, I'm David at foureyes.io. Um, you know, I think too, like we do free trials of our dealer products. Um, so they can free trial at 60 days, no strings attached, like try it out. You know, like we don't, we'll prove it to you. Yep. And that, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that's our sales process is just like, let people try our stuff. Dude, I love it. Yeah. David, well, thanks so much for taking yeah. time, Jim. Yeah. Fun. Thank you. This is great. Yeah. This is awesome. Thanks for tuning in to the Strategy with Jason podcast with your host, Jason Harris. 
Don't want to miss new content? Be sure to check out the full podcast library at strategywithjason.com to stay in the know. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Happy podcasting.